So last time, we started our journey through the various early Star Trek publications by Pocket Books, who took over publishing Star Trek around the time of Star Trek The Motion Picture. Now, these early books were initially published under Pocket's general sci-fi imprint, Timescape Books, and the early novels bear the Timescape logo along the top edge of the covers, as we can see here with the Abode to Life. Now, this was actually book six in the series, but so far they haven't actually numbered the novels. So uh, this one by Lee Corey was um, actually a pseudonym for the author George Harry Stein. Now, George was uh, considered one of the founding fathers of modern rocketry, as well as a science and technology writer. He wrote science fiction under his Lee Corey pseudonym, uh, and the highlight being the 12 book Warbot series, as well as numerous standalone novels. Um, the Abode of Life was the only Star Trek book that he ever wrote, and uh, he passed away in 1997. So let's just have a look at the back here. So on the planet Murkan, there are no stars, no moon, no outer space. The citizens of Murkan cannot conceive of the worlds beyond their own. Their son, Murkaniad, is prone to deadly radioactive flare-ups, and the Murkans have organised their life around the need to survive the ordeal until a strange visitor appears from out of nowhere. The Enterprise, badly crippled and in desperate need of repairs, must seek help from a people who cannot believe in its existence. Murkanade is about to blow, and James Kirk faces an impossible choice to attack the sun itself and save his ship and crew, or let a people live in peace in the only world they know, the abode of life. There you go, eh? A really, really great uh, jacket on this one. It's by the artist Rowena Morel, um, and she was known for her fantasy artwork. Um, the first of many books where Kirk and crew must wrestle with breaking the Prime Directive to survive. And uh, I found that this one was really well paced and balanced and a highlight amongst those early Star Trek novels. Really recommended this one. So uh, a great book, one to, to definitely look out for. So the next book we've got is the movie tie-in adaption to The Wrath of Khan, which was published in July 1982. And this is book number seven in the series. And uh, like some of the subsequent novels, this movie time was given to Vonda M. McIntyre to adapt, um, based on the screenplay by Harve Bennett and Jack B. Sowards. Now, this is a really great adaption of this excellent movie where we see the character of Khan Noonien Singh, as first seen in the classic episode Space Seed, brought back to once again battle intellects with Kirk and the crew. I'm sure you're all familiar with the story here, so I won't dwell on that. Um, throughout, we are treated to passages lifted straight from Moby Dick and a tale of two cities. Uh, these lines, when uttered by Khan through gritted teeth, are quite electric. Certainly an above average film adaption and one which went on to having many, many reprints. Um, the book jacket appears to be an adaption of the original cinema poster with artwork by Bob Peake, although uh, this isn't confirmed and I wasn't able to find out online if that was actually the case, but it's good all the same and yeah, what a cracking uh, film and movie tie-in that one is. So next we've got what would prove to be the very last photo story uh, to be published by Pocket and it is the Star Trek II Wrath of Cam photo story. Um, it's in the same vein as the earlier uh, photo uh, novel published for Star Trek, the motion picture. Um, but sadly, the internal pictures are in black and white. What a shame, considering how good the photo novel was for Star Trek, the motion picture. A real, real um, wasted opportunity because it looks fantastic once again. And all I can put it down to was the, uh, the cost of production of making one of these photo novels. It must have just been so expensive to produce. It just wasn't cost effective. But yeah, that was you know the very last photo novel to ever be produced. And I suppose by this time, you could start re-watching your um, favorite movies on home video. So they probably thought that it wasn't, you know, the market for photo novels just didn't exist anymore. Now next we've got this one, which is The Making of Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan um, by Alan Asherman. Now I had a bit of a job tracking this one down, particularly in Britain. I 
I actually don't think it was sold over here, possibly in some of the specialist shops that were around at the time, and they were pretty uh, few and far between, to be honest. Um, it's a little bit bigger than a normal novel. It's, it's in more like a B format, and it was quite expensive, $7.95. Uh, but boy, oh boy, it's a fantastic, fantastic look behind the scenes at the making of The Wrath of Khan, and it's just littered, and I mean littered, with fantastic stills. And I can definitely... Uh, recommend you trying to track a copy of this one down if you can find it. As I said, I really struggled to find this. It's taken me over a year since I've known that it's existed. There are a few copies on eBay, but even those are expensive. And then time I pay import tax to get it delivered back to the UK, it just wasn't uh, worth it. But a scarce, scarce book and uh, definitely uh, one to try and keep an eye out for. Uh, really, really good. Great little behind the scenes look at the making of The Wrath of Khan. Now, the next one also I haven't got, and that's Star Trek Biographies uh, by William Rotzler. Now, there were a couple of junior uh, Star Trek books which were published around this time um, on the back of Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Um, I may, I may do a separate video down the line looking at the Star Trek for the very younger audiences, sort of the, the, the very young adults under 12s, but they're not going to be what I'm going to be covering in these videos. I will try and cover all the non-fiction if I can find them, um, but Star Trek biographies, that's going to have to come later unless someone can track down a copy for me because I can't find one anywhere at the moment. Now, the next one to look at is this, which is Black Fire by Sonny Cooper. Now this is book number eight, and this was the first book to be published in January 1983. Now this was Sonny's first ever book. Um, she passed the manuscript to a friend of hers, SF author Theodore Sturgeon, who had got his agent to send it to the Timescape editor, David Hartwell. Now the book is actually in, in actual fact dedicated to uh, to Theodore Sturgeon, my mentor and a loving friend. So that's how this one got its first sort of, uh, um, well, found its way into print. So let's have a little look at the back here. Spock, a traitor. There is sabotage aboard the Enterprise and Spock's investigation leads him into defiance of the Federation and a bizarre alliance with the Romulan and Klingon empires against the bloodthirsty Tamari, a savage race of for whom War and battle are life itself. Now Spock has been declared a traitor and condemned to the shame of the Federation's highest security prison. And now Captain James Kirk must face the toughest decision of his command, while a lifelong friendship and the destiny of the free universe hang in the balance. And then there's a little, have you read these other Star Trek novels? Well, I've read most of them. <laughs> Um, brilliant stuff. So a real action-packed novel, this one, which greatly benefited from being Spock-centric and have guest appearances by both the Klingons and the Romulans. Seeing Spock go up against Starfleet orders is perhaps a little out of character, but within the confines of this novel, um, I do think it's fine. Um, the jacket is by Boris Villaggio, and uh, it's definitely up to his usual high standard, although the uniforms once again appear more akin to Star Trek The Motion Picture than as seen in The Wrath of Khan. Uh, possibly this piece was commissioned ahead of Khan's release. Still very, very good, and uh, another great book in the early Star Trek pocketbook series. So book number nine is Star Trek Triangle. Another timescape one still. Now, Triangle sees the established Star Trek authors Sandra Marshak and Myron Corbuth return to pocketbooks. Now, this time it sets up an intergalactic love triangle as both Kirk and Spock fall in love with the same woman. Now, like their previous novels, I can't help feeling that this was written with the female Star Trek fan in mind. So it says, Kirk's soul, Spock's life. A dark plan has been unleashed in the galaxy, a design so vast only a collective and ruthless mind like the totality would have conceived it. Now Captain Kirk must battle the seductive force of the totality's will. It was reasonable that Captain Kirk and Federation free agent Solar Than would fall in love, but no reasoning in the universe could have foreseen the tragedy of Spock's own passion for the same woman. Now this unimaginable conflict could cost Captain Kirk his very soul and bring death to the proud Vulcan. But in the unimaginable lies their only chance, and the freedom of the galaxy depends on the outcome of the Triangle. 
<laughs> the love triangle, I guess that's what it is. So interestingly, um, certainly the quality of the writing is definitely excellent. And um, you know, you can tell these, these were very, very experienced. It's just a story that didn't really appeal to me. Um, the cover art this time was by an artist called Fred Gambino. And this was the very last time that these established Star Trek authors would write any Star Trek fiction together. So a bit of a, a little mini milestone, that one. So that was a triangle. So book number 10 is Web of the Romulans by M.S. Murdoch. Now, Melinda Murdoch had been a fan of Star Trek since catching the episode A Piece of the Action back in 1969. Instantly hooked, she contributed a piece of fan fiction to a fanzine called Dilithium Crystals. In this story, the Enterprise computer falls in love with Captain Kirk. Her thoughts were that virtually everything else in the universe had fallen for him, so why not the ship's computer? <laughs> uh, through the fan network, she heard that Pocket Books were accepting submissions of new Star Trek stories, so she expanded on her original story, added in the Romulans, for good measure, and sent it in. It was three years later and several rewrites before Pocket Books eventually agreed to buy the novel. So let's read the back here. So it says, Ravaged by a killer virus, the Romulans enter Canara, where the only antidote can be found. Desperate, they incite a victorious enterprise, attack on one of their vessels, but Kirk discovers their ruse. Meanwhile, the central computer has fallen in love with him, severely crippling the enterprise. Now Kirk must bring the antidote to the Romulans before the galaxy crashes over the brink of war. <laughs> Um, certainly the writing and um, quality of the writing of this is excellent. It's just a story that once again um, didn't really appeal to me. It's, it's certainly a bit of fun um, and, and it's very well paced. It's almost like a, a classic Star Trek episode. Um, definitely a, a really, really great cover there by uh, Boris Villaggio again. Uh, interestingly, the Timescape logo now has shrunk down. So it's not right across the top. It's just in this little top right corner there. So uh, the Timescape logo is starting to uh, diminish. So this one is number 11 in the series, Yesterday's Sun by A.C. Crispin. And once again, it's got the little Timescape logo in the corner there. Now, Anne Crispin had been a lifelong Star Trek fan. While attending a convention in 1978, where the original series episode all our yesterdays were shown, she started thinking what might have become of the union of Spock and Zarabeth. Of course, they would have offspring. Now, using the Guardian, as seen in the classic episode City on the Edge of Forever, Spock, Kirk and McCoy go back in time to bring back Spock's son, Zar, to the present day. So the Romulans attack the planet Gateway, where Federation scientists are studying the Guardian of Forever, the mysterious portal to the past. The Enterprise must protect the Guardian or destroy it, but Spock has already used the portal to journey to the past. On the planet Sarpedian, 5,000 years ago, Spock knew a beautiful primitive woman. Now he has gone to meet his son. <laughs> fantastic stuff, eh? Absolutely fantastic. So a superb premise and a great way to continue the story. I love the way that this adds another layer to those original episodes. And once again, a great cover by Boris Villaggio depicting Spock and his son. Um, the actual book name is in a reflective silver font, as you can just sort of see there. Um, and the novel would be followed by a sequel, Time for Yesterday, which is number 39 in the series. And uh, we'll see that one in a, in a couple of videos time. So book number 12, published in October 1983, is Mutiny on the Enterprise by Robert E. Vardaman. Now, this was Robert E. Vardaman's second Star Trek novel. Since his first book, The Klingon Gambit, he had changed agents. Now, when Timescape editor David Hartwell contacted his original agent to buy the second book, the new agent was in place. So thankfully, there were no hard feelings uh, and the book got published as planned back in October 1983. So the ship is crippled in orbit around a dangerous, living, breathing planet and a desperate peace mission to the Orion Arm is stalled. Kirk has never needed his crew more, but a lithe alien woman is casting a spell of pacifism and now mutiny over the crew. 
Suddenly, Captain Kirk's journey for peace has turned into a terrifying war to retake command of his ship. So, Vardaman says that this novel was loosely based on the Robert Heinlein classic Starman Jones. He found the idea of an entire planet being one interconnected intelligence fascinating. Once again, another great cover by Boris Villaggio, with the, the heads of the three characters on the front repeated in, in the little boxes on the rear cover. And the book's title this time is in gold foil, so they're going up, uh, going up market there. Good stuff. So book 13 in the numbered series was The Wounded Sky by Diane Duane. Now, Diane Duane got into Star Trek right from the very start. She admits to having an instant crush on Leonard and Moy's Spock character, and she started writing her own fan fiction, although this never actually got into print, not even in a fanzine. However, she continued to write and had published The Door Into Fire, which was nominated for a Locus Award for Best Fantasy Novel. After reading a few of the later Ballantine novels and being somewhat unimpressed with them, she, de she decided to have a go at writing one herself, and it was submitted to Pocket Books and accepted and published in December 1983 as uh, this one here, The Wounded Sky. A pretty alien scientist invents the intergalactic inversion drive, an engine system that transcends warp drive, and the Enterprise will be the first to test it. The Klingons attempt to thwart the test, but a greater danger looms when strange symptoms surface amongst the crew and time becomes meaningless. Now Captain Kirk and his friends face their greatest challenge, to repair the fabric of the universe before time is lost forever. <laughs> it's an excellent story, this, which does work on many levels. It's no surprise that Diane Duane has written lots more Star Trek novels, which obviously we'll cover in future videos. Um, yet another Boris Villaggio cover, and also the last to bear the original Timescape logo on the front cover. Um, a few years later, Star Trek The Next Generation was commissioned as a series and every writer under the sun wanted to get involved. Sadly, Diane hadn't written a lot of TV, um, so she didn't have any experience at this point. But she was sharing a room with writer Michael Reeves. Now, he had come up with a Star Trek The Next Generation script, but said it was far too familiar to Diane's original novel, The Wounded Sky. He asked her if she would like to co-author the script with him, and it became the Star Trek The Next Generation episode, Where No One Has Gone Before. How cool is that, eh? Now, I've actually got two copies of this one. I've got a later reprint which turned up. Um, this later edition is quite interesting to compare them side by side. So by now, the Timescape logo has been dropped, but the number has been added in the top right corner. Um, also, the book, this one's glossy, and it's actually trimmed a bit of the, the cover. And you can see Boris's signature has disappeared. There it was on the bottom of the original, and uh, on the reprint, it's gone. The reason I've got this second copy is because um, it came along with a batch of other Star Trek books that I bought. Um, so this is the, the third printing from December 83, but it's uh, signed by the author, which is quite nice. I haven't got many signed Star Trek books. I've got a handful, and uh, this is one of them. So I thought that was quite, quite nice to have. So that was book 13, The Wounded Sky, and uh, a real classic of its sort. So book 14, published in February 1984, is this one, The Trisilane Confrontation by David Dvorkin. Now, David Dvorkin had been working at NASA on the original Apollo missions during the first season of Star Trek. He remembers missing the first couple of episodes, but then never missing a single show. In later life, he became a writer with this novel, The Trisilane Confrontation, his first of several Star Trek works. So the Enterprise has rushed to the war-torn Trisilian. Kirk is on the bridge of a Klingon warship. McCoy is dining with cannibals and the ship is surrounded by Romulans. In the neutral zone, power is up for grabs. Now only the ingenuity and raw courage of the Enterprise crew can avert disaster. <laughs> Doesn't give a lot away in that one, does it? But certainly uh, hints at the adventure to come. Um, so this was a fun read, clearly written by the author, who knew his Star Trek history. Uh, the Klingons and the Romulans are seamlessly woven into the storyline 
and the characterization is excellent. Um, I've not been able to get a definitive answer on who the cover artist was on this one, but it sure looks like Boris Valagio again, but I, I could be wrong. I really couldn't find out who it was online. Um, now, David's son, um, Daniel Dvorkin, would also go on to write classic Star Trek novels. Um, this book has no mention of Timescape, except for a little name on the bottom of the spine there. You see that the little Timescape name there? Um, the imprint would be quietly put to bed, and now all future Star Trek books were published under the main Pocket Books label with a science fiction subheading. So that was the very end of Timescape, just on that little spine there. Now, book 15 is Corona by Greg Bear. Now, award-winning science fiction and fantasy author Greg Bear took 90 days to pen this, um, and it was his only Star Trek novel. And he says he wrote it on his very first computer. It is quite a thin book, this one. Um, yeah, 192 pages, a bit thinner than some of the other ones of the period. Um, a fan of the show since the early days, he actually met Gene Roddenberry, who convinced him to pitch story ideas for Star Trek Phase 2 back in 1977. Obviously, this series never got produced and the franchise went straight into the movies. Quite interesting, that. So, an awesome, sentient force of protostars, Corona, has taken control of a stranded team of Vulcan scientists. The Enterprise has come on a rescue mission with a female reporter and a new computer that can override Kirk's command. Suddenly, the rescuers must save themselves and the entire universe before Corona unleashes a big bang. <laughs> Mine's got a little Odyssey 7. That was a science fiction shop, I believe, in Birmingham. £2.70 import price on that one. Um, certainly a fairly standard Star Trek story, but, but you can tell that Greg Bear was already an established author and really familiar with the original source material. Um, obviously, he did all that study, I guess, back in 1977. The writings of a very high standard, and this is probably why he was given complete editorial freedom by the series editor. Although once again not credited, um, the cover does appear to be by Boris Fellagio, but there is literally no sign of an artist's signature on there anywhere. Um, but since he did so many in this period, I'd be surprised if it wasn't him. So the last book we're going to look at today is this one, The Final Reflection by John M. Ford. Now this was the first book in the Star Trek series to be numbered, in this case number 16, you see in the corner there, and published in May 1984. Now, this was also the last book to be published before The Search for Spock was released. Now, it's notable for the majority of the book, bar the opening and closing pages, as they do not feature the regular Star Trek crew. The story focuses instead on the life of a young Klingon who becomes the captain of a Klingon battlecruiser. Klingon Captain Kren is a ruthless war strategist, but on a mission to Earth, Kryn learns a lesson in peace. Suddenly he must fight a secret battle of his own. His empire has a covert plan to shatter the Federation. Only Kryn can prevent a war at the risk of his own life. Now, certainly this was something a bit different and highly unusual at the time. The focus and depth of the Klingon Empire is explored here as well as the start of the Klingon language. Now, parts of this work were used in the, as the basis for the FASA Star Trek role-playing game, the RPG game. Um, now, series editor David Hartwell notes that this was very much as intended and that the book would go on to sell hundreds of thousands of copies. A loose sequel to this story would be penned by Ford and published in 1987 as How Much for Just the Planet. Thank you very much for watching today. And if you have enjoyed the video, do please give it a thumbs up. Do please consider subscribing for regular classic Star Trek book content. I've got lots more planned, uh, not just the pocket books, but British annuals. Um, and obviously we'll be moving through the later series as we progress through these. Um, thank you for watching today. And I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Live long and prosper. Bye.